Welcome to part 40 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. In this installment, we will explore the kitchen, the final space in our multi-part examination of the five rooms within the kitchen wing of the house. The kitchen is conveniently located on the first floor, unlike many large houses of the day, which placed the room in the basement, thus necessitating the need for a dumbwaiter. The kitchen served as the central space in the servant's wing, as noted by the six doorways, which connected to the exterior, basement, servant's passage, and three adjacent rooms. The room measures approximately 16 by 16 feet and contains over 250 square feet of space. Access from the exterior is provided by a dedicated doorway and porch in the courtyard. This south-facing orientation allows abundant sunlight to enter the room through a window in the door and another window over the sink. This arrangement also provided good ventilation, an important consideration for a room that was designed to be thoroughly modern, addressing developing theories about germs and hygiene. All of the surfaces in the room were durable and easy to clean. This included the painted ceiling, which featured a soapstone finish comprised of a base layer of paint to which a secondary layer of translucent glaze was applied with a rag or sponge. The completed finish was decorative and could easily be wiped down with water. Many visitors to the house look at the kitchen walls and assume they are covered in subway tile. This is not the case. The walls are constructed of brick, which is coated with a ceramic glaze to provide a surface that is both easy to clean and reflective, making the room brighter. The brick structure of the walls can be seen in the segmental arches located above windows and doors. Although brick like this was being used in commercial and industrial applications at the time, this was a relatively early use of the material in a private home. The specific type of brick used is known as Philadelphia pressed brick, as seen in this 1870s ad for a Chicago dealer. The term Philadelphia brick became a generic term for all pressed brick of the era, whether or not it was actually produced in that region. It was widely used in an unglazed form for many buildings in Chicago following the Great Fire of 1871. True Philadelphia brick was known for its deep red color, as seen here in an image from the Glessner Coach House. This wall was later rebuilt, resulting in some of the brick ends being visible, although they would not have been in the original construction. This image also shows the crackle pattern known as crazing on the surface. This occurred during the second firing of the brick when the glaze would shrink more than the brick itself. The crazing did not impact the integrity of the brick or the glaze at all. The floor is covered in unglazed encaustic tiles set in a simple checkerboard pattern. The color goes all the way through the tile, ensuring the design never wears away. The red and buff tiles are four and a quarter inches wide, with slightly smaller tiles forming the border. The tiles were produced by the American Encaustic Tiling Company, which had its main plant in Zanesville, Ohio, the same town in which John Glessner was born and raised. The new plant, shown here, was completed in 1892, by which time the company had become the largest tile producer in the world surpassing its English competitors like Minton. At some point, the Glessners had the tile floor covered over with sheet linoleum, a product developed in Great Britain in the 1860s and first made in the United States a decade later. Why this change was made is not known, although it would have provided a slightly softer surface for the cook to stand on. The range was the subject of a previous secrets video, so won't be discussed here. See the description below for the link. The tile surrounding the range on the wall is curious, as the glazed brick itself would have easily withstood the heat. Since this photo shows the second gas range installed in the kitchen, one thought is that there may have been damage to the original brick from the original range, and it was easier to simply cover the walls with tile rather than repairing the brick. An important element of the kitchen was the Annunciator, also known as the servant's call box. It can be seen on the far wall in this view from the dry pantry. 
In the late 1960s, it was found in the basement and was repaired and remounted in its original location. A button in each of the main rooms of the house connected to this device so that servants could be called for whenever needed. An earlier video demonstrated the annunciator. See the link in the description below. Located below the annunciator is a small hole in the wall, seen at left. The surviving remnant of the speaking tube, which connected the kitchen to Francis Glessner's second floor conservatory. It is missing its mouthpiece, an example of which can be seen at right, taken from an 1880s hardware catalog. The mouthpiece contained a whistle. If you wanted to speak to someone, you would first blow into the speaking tube, which would activate the whistle, alerting the person at the other end. The building specifications called for the large sink with drain board to be constructed of soapstone, a very hard and durable material, appropriate for a sink used not only for food preparation, but also for the washing of cast iron pots and pans. The space under the sink was specifically left open, as this was considered more hygienic. The sink was very modern for its day, including two relatively new devices. The first was a tucker grease trap, which, as its name suggests, would collect grease, thus avoiding the clogging of pipes. It was offered by the Meyer Sniffen Company, which provided all the plumbing fixtures in the house. The top of the grease trap was built into the bottom of the sink. It was made of brass and had an inner lining that could be easily removed for cleaning. This particular model was specifically designed for use with soapstone sinks. Another modern convenience was a water filter made by the Crocker Filter Company of Boston. The filter ball measured three inches in diameter and attached directly to the cold water tap. It filtered the water by passing it through two fine wire cloth strainers and a body of fine animal charcoal. John Glessner requested a pitcher of filtered water in his dressing room both morning and evening. The 1936 estate inventory for the house lists two tables in the kitchen, a wood drop leaf table and one with a porcelain top. Tops such as this became popular in the first quarter of the 20th century as they were easy to keep clean and were resistant to heat. The original top was found in the basement and a new wood base was created to match the table as seen in the 1923 image at right. When the Lithographic Technical Foundation moved into the house in 1945, they converted the rooms in the kitchen wing into various laboratories. The 1948 image at right shows the type of equipment that would have been used in the kitchen, set into the alcove previously occupied by the gas range. This image was taken by Richard Nickel about 1970 and shows the condition of the room after the house was purchased from the Printing Foundation. They had removed all the elements of the room, including the range, copper range hood, sink, and hanging closet. Fortunately, the original encaustic tile floor had survived intact beneath the sheet linoleum added by the Glessners. This view, looking south, was taken about 1975, shortly before restoration of the room was begun, under the supervision of preservation architect Wilbert Hasbrook. Original floor plans, building specifications, and clues on the walls were all used to recreate the room as closely as possible to its original appearance. For example, the hanging closet on the north wall had long since been removed. This drawing, taken from one of the original sections of the house prepared in Richardson's office, provided valuable information regarding its appearance. Taking the original sketch and comparing it to holes on the wall allowed the closet to be rebuilt exactly as first designed, including the use of white pine as stipulated in the building specifications. The sink also had to be rebuilt from scratch. Since no photo survived, other historic sinks of the period were examined to pull accurate details down to the shape and design of the brass legs. Hasbrook's sketch for the new legs is shown at left. A completed leg is shown at right. Restoration of the room was completed in 1981, 
and included new light fixtures, repainting the ceiling, obtaining a period gas range, fabricating a new range hood, repairing and resetting the tile floor, and making new doors to replace those that had been lost. Today, the kitchen provides a wonderful opportunity to step back in time and see how the space would have appeared originally. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about the kitchen and how it was designed to be state-of-the-art when completed in 1887. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.